All right. I'm an internet study scholar. And in the last decade alone, I have seen the rise of so many numerous technology innovation projects emerge from Silicon Valley to tackle poverty heads on. These are very sensational projects. So while these are well-meaning and totally imaginative, what I'm here today to argue is that these are actually tremendously harmful to the world's poor. What I'm gonna to do today is make visible some key myths that are circulating in the name of technology innovation. So first let's ask, what do we mean by sensational technology innovation projects? Picture this, we are all in the Kalahari Desert in Botswana. It's very quiet. The tribe is doing the daily chores, children are running, and then you hear the strange sound. It's a sound of a helicopter overhead. And the tribe has never heard anything like it before. It's practically a miracle. So what happens next is even more miraculous. The door of the helicopter opens and from their tablets start to fall from the sky. The kids are so excited. They run towards the tablets and the adults sort of move away because they're really nervous. And the children start to play with these new toys because they're so gadgety. And before you know it, they have learned how to use computers. So how many of you guys think this is a believable proposition? Raise your hands. Not that many. Yeah, some hopeful, utopic people, all right? So um, what if I were to tell you that this was actually a serious proposition made at a Silicon Valley summit in 2011 in, uh, by none other than Nic Nicholas Negroponte. Now for those who do not know who he is, let me tell you a little bit about him. He's one of the biggest technology evangelists of our time. He's the head of the MIT Media Lab in the US and the head of the One Laptop Per Child project, which basically promises innovative and very affordable laptops and tablets to every child, including the poorest of the poor children. So um, when one of the reporters asked him, saying, hey, you serious about this proposition of dro dropping tablets from the sky? And this is what he said. He said, of course. We will literally take tablets and drop them out of helicopters. I mean it. It's like a Coke bottle falling out of the sky. Very quotable quote, right? So what is he referring to when he says the Coke bottle falling out of the sky? How many of you have heard of this movie, The Gods Must Be Crazy? I thought there would be a generation gap here. Shame on you guys. All right, so I'm glad to know I'm so young. Um, so The Gods Must Be Crazy it was this 1980s movie. Remember that. Um, the 90s, 80s movie, which was basically literally about a Coke bottle falling from a plane in the Kalahari Desert somewhere. This tribe discovers this bottle and says, oh wow, what is this? They think it's a musical instrument, a rolling pin. And they're so intrigued by it, but slowly this intrigue becomes, leads to this infighting and major tribal discord to a point the elders get fed up and said, we have to get rid of this evil object from our tribe to go back to tribal harmony. So it's kind of ironic that Negroponte is equating his beloved laptops with this evil object, right? But I digress. So if you're not convinced about these sensational projects, here's another sensational project for you, this time in a slum in the north of India. So there's a hole in a wall, and a computer is placed through it. And so you can just see the screen. And there's a mouse attached to it. There's no keyboard. It's basically like this. Now you have to remember, the children have never seen a computer before in these slums. So they're really interested in what's this shiny object emerging from the wall. So they gather around, play with it, and before you know it, they've learned how to use the paint function, and they know how to play games. And you know, at this point, you shrug your shoulders. You're like, come on, my five-year-old niece and nephew knows how to figure out the mobile phone. What's so great about that? Yes, yeah, true. But that's not what's miraculous. It's what happens next. 
There are also texts, like actual documents, in academic jargon, which we all love, in English, which is not their native language, on topics like chemistry, uh, you know, biology, physics, and the kids open them and play with these documents. And in a few months, when they went, were talked to, they knew everything about chemistry and biology, and they were going on about DNA replication. That's a miracle. This experiment was done by Sugata Mitra in the 1990s. And it was all, uh, you know, he's a professor at Newcastle University. And he became pretty famous. And some of you may already have heard of him because of his TED Talks on unsupervised learning. It's about how children, particularly poor children, with the help of computers and the internet, can do anything as long as they put their mind to it. And you can imagine typical TED heads give him a standing ovation. And of course, why not? It's a heartwarming message, isn't it? So in 2008, I was doing research in a village in the Himalayas, and I came across one of these experiments of Mithras. But it was this abandoned concrete structure gaping at me. So I was like, what happened? Wasn't this supposed to be the savior project? So I talked to the villagers and said, what went wrong? So a number of things came up. One of the computers caught a lot of viruses, and there was no uh, support stuff. So it just stopped getting used. Another one was completely vandalized. And the third computer was taken over by a bunch of boys who were pretty much either gaming or watching pornography, much to the dismay of the villagers. So that was the fate of the project. In fact, since then, it's been more than a decade, outside of Mitra and his team, majority of the scholarship on these experiments have conclusively supported similar results and conclusions. But the bottom line is that when children are unsupervised and they're left with technologies, they primarily play rather than work. They will choose gaming instead of physics or math. Seems rather intuitive, right? As for Negroponte, Negroponte's project, because it was so cost intensive, there were actual formal evaluations done, which went on for more than a decade in Latin America and Africa. And what they found, and they conclusively said, was this project is a failure. And we're talking about uh, you know, in World Bank, a number of massive, legitimate institutions declaring it a failure because it basically showed that it had no real impact on learning. Why? A couple of reasons. The hardware and software was very experimental, and they did not have support staff. Again, big, typical usual story. Uh, they believed the children would serve as support staff because they had this natural intuition. They were, uh, intuition. They were digital natives. Um, so for example, Uruguay got 50,000 laptops. And in a very short while, they got deactivated and were of no use. So another bigger reason for its failure was that basically they had a complete aversion towards communities of any kind. They did not want any kind of interference between the user, that is a child, and the technology, because they believed that would be an intrusion in the learning process. So no teachers, no elders, no parents. And that was fundamentally seen as a reason for its failure. So, you know, it's worth asking at this point, surely with this mountain of evidence on failure, what could have happened to these tech evangelists, these tech messiahs? Well, unfortunately, they are more powerful than ever, more influential than ever today. And Nicholas Negroponte sits on many boards of technology innovation uh, that are actually shaping these uh, futuristic technologies, particularly for poor countries. As for Mitra, he just recently won the TED Prize for his bold ideas. And what's even more disturbing is that they have not at all changed their stand on their core perspective and belief in technology in spite of all this evidence. They continue to believe technology is the be all end all. It is the heart of radical change. And secondly, people like communities come in the way. So we need to get rid of the communities and celebrate this beautiful union between the user and the technology. 
So today I'm here to really bring down these technology profits by really focusing and dismantling the myths that they're constantly circulating in the name of technology innovation. The first myth is extreme poverty needs extreme measures. Now we have become so saturated with the poverty porn that surrounds us. This is poverty porn of helpless children starving, dying, to a point that we are so inundated and exhausted by these images that we've made to believe that there's nothing we can do except all we can hope is for a miracle. Now this kind of fatalism is deeply leveraged by technology messiahs because they offer us a faith. They offer us a faith in technology. And that's a very dangerous thing. Because when we place all our faith in technology, what we're doing is we're creating even more unrealistic expectations of a tool, and we're dooming it to failure before it even begins. And that also means that the funding will be channeled more into sensational, sexy projects, which just miraculously happens, where you leave a computer, disappear for nine months, come back, and you know, wow, these kids have learned, um, versus actually evidence-based pragmatic projects. And so this is what's at stake. Second myth is the poor need more technology experiments. We have been told and we've come to be convinced that we, there are a lot of unknowns about the poor, about the impact of mass media technologies on poor communities, when then apps, that's absolutely not true. We have decades of evidence solid research, which goes back to the times of the radio, television, the first generation of computers, to today's mobile phone and tablets, which show the impact of mass media on poor communities. And basically, there is a consensus that there is no quick fix. Technologies by themselves cannot create radical change in desperate situations, in very constrained, resource-constrained places. You have to work with the communities for there, there to be a really systemic change. And yet, um, what's crazy is that the field of international development within which I am uh, analyzing these, you know, uh, infusion of technologies is inundated with pilot projects and experiments to a point we jokingly say that the field is suffering from pilotitis. So, if we know there are so many experiments and pilots, why does it keep happening and why, uh, why is more money going into it? For a simple reason. Silicon Valley loves pilot projects. They love experiments. Why? Because when you call a project an experiment, you are forgiven, you are exempt from failure towards the poor communities. After all, if you are doing an experiment, there's more likelihood that you're going to fail than succeed, which is the nature of innovation. And so you're forgiven for that. The other reason is that a lot of these tech companies want to penetrate these emerging market economies, but don't want to invest long term. So they need an exit strategy. That's where experiments come in. So they go in and they set up their project. And when it's done and they've got the contracts, they are out of there. So it gives them a sort of a shortcut as well as great corporate branding where they can do good and make profit at the same time. The poor have nothing to lose. Another very powerful myth when on the contrary, they have everything to lose. In fact, one of the most popular perceptions going on is that these kind of projects, whether it's Mithras or Negropontes, is pro bono, it's altruistic, it's charitable, it's free, which it's not. Very poor countries, re deeply resource constrained, have channeled most of their budgets in these kind of crazy sensational projects because they really believed and they really got uh, you know, caught into this real fervor of a miracle. For example, Rwanda. It had $109 per student for primary education in their budget. And instead, what they did was they channeled that budget to the $100 laptop per child, which was Negroponte's project, which is basically they gambled away an entire generation's primary education. And there are no alternatives. When the project fails, 
you have failed a child and there are no backups. So this is actually very irresponsible. So the last part is that the poor are different from us. Now, there has been a war against poverty for decades. This phrase war on poverty basically has been pushing us to believe that the poor are somehow exotic, they're different. They have different value systems, belief systems. In fact, maybe even the culture is so different, that's why they're probably poor. And this myth has been circulating for decades now. You know, it launched by uh, Lyndon Johnson in the 1960s and has carried on today. Now, we have now evidence showing that that's absolutely not true, that there is no intrinsic culture of poverty that belongs to poor communities. Otherwise, you would have no progress whatsoever. Yet that myth is so strong and powerful because it helps us rationalize the hypocrisy that is what's good for my friends and family is not appropriate for the poor. You can have a double standard and feel good about it and rationalize it away. So either you're dehumanizing people, like creating blank slates that the, the poor are nothing and have nothing to offer, or we are superhumanizing them, like Mithra's project, where unlike an average child, the poor child with just access to the internet and computers can do anything, including learning DNA replication. So either way, when we're doing these, we're creating these fictional communities on the basis of which innovation is being designed, which is bound to fail because these communities do not exist. So what's the takeaway here? The takeaway here is that there are no miracles and quick fixes. We cannot believe and we cannot channel our energies towards sensational projects, but we really need to discipline ourselves and really ask for what is the evidence that is driving these projects. And moreover, we need to invest just as much in institutional innovation as we are in technology innovation, because the two go hand in hand. As for the poor don't need more, no experiments, they definitely, we need to stop with these experiments and pilots unless there's a real reason for it, and instead go for long-term investments and initiatives in these poor communities. They need stability, they need security. In fact, currently the poor communities have become a graveyard of failed technologies, and a moral conscience has got to come forth and make a stop to this. Um, the other aspect is this perception that the poor uh, have nothing to offer, they're, they're blank slates. As Mitra actually had brought up defensively, uh, when people asked him, why do you continue experimenting? It's almost two decades. Why do you call your projects experiments? And the team reacted defensively saying, you have no right to judge, you don't know, these poor communities have nothing, so at least this is something. And that's a very dangerous logic. Because what you're doing is, when you sort of uh, dehumanize and create a blank slate of sort of this abyss of nothingness that communities are, then you can rationalize any intervention, however baseless. In fact, on the contrary, these people are deeply resourceful. Think about it, these are survival communities. They have so many, uh, they have life stacked against them. They have to fight so many odds. So how could we not leverage on these survival communities who had to be and have to be creative and constantly ingenious to survive for them and their children? So let them be your resources and not your barriers for the design of technology innovation. And the last aspect is that let's move away from fiction and let's hold on to facts. Let's understand that the poor are much like you and me with similar kinds of aspirations, desires, dreams. And if we continue holding on to fictions, then we are creating technologies which belong to nobody and will be useless because it cannot be applied to the very people who need them the most. So the bottom line here is there is absolutely no place for faith in technology innovation. There is no room for miracles or messiahs. We need to challenge these myths that constantly circulate in the name of technology innovation. And in the spirit of the March for Science, let me say one thing is that let evidence 
and not sensationalism be your guide. Thank you.